After 30 years of the same representation, San Francisco deserves a champion willing to return our city to the front lines of the progressive movement. Our city stands for inclusion and pride, peace and justice, and environmental sustainability. We can't wait another 30 years for our leaders to evolve on climate change. Delay is no better than denial. The time for action was yesterday. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited for this week's live stream, Shahid here. We've got an exciting next hour planned. We're gonna be joined by two voices from a pair of local organizations uh, I'm a mm -hmm. member of and that have both endorsed our campaign to replace Nancy Pelosi as San Francisco's voice in the house. I'm a very proud member of both the San Francisco Bernie Kratz as well as DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, San Francisco. And uh, we'll be joined in a little bit by voices from each of those two groups, Simone Manganelli, from the SF Bernie Kratz and Shanti Singh from DSA SF. <clears throat> and we'll be having conversations particularly about housing rights, housing policy, and organizing opportunities for each of us to get involved in advancing tenants' rights and ensuring that we can have housing for all as a, a real possibility uh, in our lifetimes. I uh, wanna run down a few first uh, campaign events and, and recent highlights for you just before we pull in Simone. Uh, last Friday on May Day, I was very excited to be a part of a car caravan that stretched across several neighborhoods in San Francisco, calling for the cancellation and suspension of rent and mortgage and utility and debt payments. That's a crucial reform, and it's a reasonable demand, especially just think about how we've how many times have we bailed out banks, and why aren't banks then paying for the costs of this pandemic instead of struggling Americans with their backs to the wall? Uh, the car caravan is a really interesting tactic. Uh, we might get into it a little bit later. Uh, another current event that I had a chance to speak about uh, last Thursday on Rising on the Hill with Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty are the tax giveaways, the tax breaks for millionaires included in the CARES Act. And I've spoken uh, very positively about elements of the CARES Act, and I'm glad that there is a direct payment, however meager, to many Americans, even if not all of us, and I would have liked to have seen a universal cash payment that is ongoing, a UBI program, particularly as an emergency measure responding to the pandemic. And that is not, of course, what Congress 
adopted, I was especially excited to see the expansion of unemployment insurance that Senator Bernie Sanders uh, coerced basically from Congress, which extends unemployment insurance benefits to gig workers and students for the first time. Huge, huge step forward. And unfortunately, at the same time that Congress gave $100 billion to hospitals, which is absolutely important, Congress gave more money away to millionaires in the forms of tax breaks. 43,000 individuals are going to receive tax windfalls over a million dollars each. And the idea that millionaires are getting tax breaks is offensive in the first place in the middle of a pandemic, we should all be outraged. And, and I think the fact that the House leadership was supporting that is, to say the least, problematic. Before we move to, uh, uh, actually just one more, I'm going to shout out some volunteers in just a second. But the last recent event I wanted just to mention was Monday's tragic anniversary of the Kent State shootings. So a lot of people might not remember these events. I was not yet born, uh, or at least you know, politically conscious at the time, but Kent State, and this is student activists opposing the war in Vietnam, gunned down and killed by the National Guard. It was a pivotal moment in the American consciousness. People have described it as the moment that the 60s died, uh, certainly a moment when uh, the tide seemed to turn against visionary voices seeking the vindication of human rights and peace principles that have inspired our civilizations for eons. Uh, I'm particularly uh, alarmed this year to learn a uh, somewhat overlooked piece of the history that I had not learned before. Many black students at historically black colleges and universities were also killed around the same time, and the media did not cover their stories to nearly the same degree as the shootings at Kent State. So I raise that just because our threats to civil liberties are growing increasingly poignant by the day under the presidency of Donald Trump. And given the administration of a criminal president, I just want to remind people how vulnerable and fragile are even the most basic rights and how in our nation's history and the not very distant past, we have chosen to be, and no one was held accountable for being viciously repressive of dissent. And that's an outcome that we certainly can't tolerate going forward. It's a, a, a possibility that alarms me very much as animating my candidacy for Congress. A uh, few recent things that are coming up soon, I should say. I did an interview with Cenk Uger at the Young Turks yesterday. It should be posted any day now. Uh, also be guest hosting Status Coup with Tina Desiree Berg later this week. And uh, every other day this week and going forward, our campaign is hosting trainings where anyone, anywhere, can plug in. We have a phone bank. Hundreds of people have already uh, gone through the training process. We would love to include you. If you are interested in climate justice, if you're interested in racial justice, if you're interested in housing for all, which we'll be talking about with our guests in just a minute, plugging into our phone bank is one way to help make it happen. This is the first time Nancy Pelosi has ever faced a Democrat in a November election, and especially with the pandemic forcing us off the doors and away from events. One of the key ways for us to reach voters, frankly, is you and uh, really appreciate the help and support of the hundreds of people who've plugged in. I wanna shout out some of our all-stars. Uh, so big shout outs, particularly to uh, Donish, to Catherine, to Duncan, L, Vivian, and Nicholas. Each of them have made uh, uh, many dozens of phone calls, in some cases, hundreds. And uh, I also wanna give a couple shout outs to a few volunteers who've plugged in on our turnout operation. So while the folks I just shouted out were calling voters, the folks I'll shout out now have been calling other volunteers to help them get trained on the new phone banking tools that we recently launched. And they are Adam Singer, who's been uh, uh, very active in our campaign, Michelle Prendergast, and Scott Starling. So many thanks to uh, uh, each of you for, uh, for joining us and uh, making such a big difference in the phone bank. Uh, so I'm going to turn now to the first of our guests joining us from the San Francisco Bernie Kratz is Simone Manganelli. Simone is one of the proponents of the proposed San Francisco Community Housing Act. Now, this is a ballot measure uh, designed to create permanently affordable and permanently publicly owned housing geared toward the working class. He's been involved in a number of different efforts around homelessness, housing, and mutual aid projects, including uh, Prop C in November 2018, mass distribution in San Francisco during the wildfire season in 2018, as well as efforts to bring back public housing, including the Community Housing Act. Thank you so much for joining us, Simone. Hey, Sahid, how's it going? Uh, it's um, amazing, actually. I feel I feel very privileged myself, especially given what I hear so many of our neighbors uh, and, and supporters around the country going through. Um, how are you doing in the face of the pandemic? You hanging in there? 
Yeah, hanging in there. You know, it's uh, I'm also in a privileged position, but you know, it's it's really uh, disappointing to see how the city has just not addressed the housing crisis, especially when there are thousands of people on our streets, and it's actually getting worse. I don't know if uh, kind of you've seen some of the reports, but um, it's been getting worse in the last you know few months from the pandemic, and also just in the past few years, um, just over how um, unsustainable the housing market is here in San Francisco and how unaffordable it's become. And it's just one of these things that has been getting worse and worse and worse. And we think it can't get worse and it just continues to get worse. Yeah. Let's dive into so, it. I want to give a quick shout out to our listeners. Please ask questions in the chat. We'll be inviting uh, each of you to share questions you might want Simone to respond to. And we'll, we'll pick a few uh, before we, uh, before we wrap up. Um, talk particularly about you know the preceding crisis before the pandemic, before we get into the pandemic itself and your uh, proposal with the Community Housing Act. But when we when we reflect on the city's failure to ensure an adequate supply of affordable housing to meet the community's needs, uh, what jumps out at you in the course of that history? I think there's a couple things. You know, th this has been going on for decades. This is not you know a new problem. It's been something where you know housing has been uh, privatized over decades, both by Republican and Democratic administrations um, on the federal level. Um, in the local level, um, we have seen you know just a lot of uh, the gentrification happening in the city and pushing out a lot of low and middle income people from the city. And if you've actually uh, some of the data that the city itself compiles shows that you know middle income people especially are being pushed out. Um, out of the city um, into, you know, uh, out uh, the rest of the Bay and even farther than that. And, you know, low income people um, are just getting devastated. And, you know, they're being pushed out into the streets. You know, we've seen our homeless population grow. And the, it, there's, been, there's been a lot of effort around, you know, uh, affordable housing, but we just haven't seen the dedication to really solving the crisis. You know, we've been putting, you know, a, a few tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars here and there towards, you know, affordable housing, and that's great. And there are a lot of, you know, so, uh, uh, um, organizations around the city that are pushing that and have been, you know, really instrumental in pushing the city as far as its elected leaders go. Um, but one of the things that's been lacking is a push for public housing. And, you know, public housing has been defunded over, you know, decades and has been turned privatized and turned into, you know, uh, uh, housing that is unaffordable. And it's um, it's just if you look at if you look at the, the, the course of it over the history, it's just it's just devastating. And so. Um, one of the things that we want to do at the Bernie Kratz and, the, you know, with the Community Housing Act is to really bring back public housing into the public consciousness, um, because it's one of the great ways to bring people, to, to address poverty, is to give people housing and at a rate, you know, that's affordable to them that they can actually pay um, and that doesn't, you know, push them out onto the streets or doesn't subject them to, you know, ridiculous increases by landlords of 15, 20%, you know, every year or something like that, especially when you're living in probably the most expensive city in the nation, which is San Francisco. Right. And, and how much of this dynamic you're describing, the uh, speculative commoditization of the housing market, really driven by a not just uh, a real estate market that is ultimately for profit, but also a private banks. I mean, I see here the opportunity, to just, the, the energy in the city around public banking dovetailing with this push for publicly owned housing and the reclamation of publicly owned infrastructure and service opportunities like banking. You know, I see that as a real potential paradigm shift that we have a chance to help secure here in San Francisco. Absolutely. You know, what, one of the real great examples that we point to when we talk about public housing, you know, people say public housing, you know, it's we don't have it anymore. You know, government doesn't uh, do housing very well, which is definitely true. You know, the history of public housing is racist and classist and it's really bad. Um, and so we want to bring it back in a way that addresses those issues and makes it equitable and affordable to everyone. But you one of the great really examples, to, just to, to press on that piece, you, you guys um, built some provisions into the Community Housing Act to ensure that the problems that emerged in the past uh, around publicly owned housing are, are you know, addressed and, and prevented. Do you want to talk about some of those uh, components of the measure and how it responds to that history? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things that is uh, worrisome is in San Francisco is actually in the Mission District. We were looking at the at the income levels, and it's already the median income in the in the Mission District is already at you know eighty thousand, hundred thousand hmm. uh, dollars per person, and it's already been gentrified to a great extent. Um, there are still a lot of working class you know people in that area, but uh, it's it's at risk of continually having you know higher income people coming in pushing out the, the lower income people and so one of the one of the um, uh, provisions that we put into the community housing act is this uh, gentrification protection and what it says is in a neighborhood where um, there is a substantial amount of low income people well below the median across the city which mm -hmm. is you know the, uh, median income levels when we talk about housing programs are often done on a very regional level but they miss the 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 minute changes that happen at a neighborhood to neighborhood level and so when you create city policies or regional or even citywide policies for a city like San Francisco you often end up exacerbating some of those same inequalities because you you miss those neighborhood level you know differences mm -hmm. and so our gentrification production what it does is it says you know, in in uh, neighborhoods or census tracts that have a substantially lower amount or a lower income overall in that you know in that neighborhood, what it means is it um, forces the um, community to have input on what the income levels of the Community Housing Act housing um, allows into that certain neighborhood. So you know, we have we have a across the city we have about a, a general distribution which is you know twenty percent of five different categories of income levels. Um, and that goes from zero to 30%, 30 to 50%, 50 to 80% of AMI, area medium income, 80 to 120% and 120 to uh, uh, above that. So, you know, it's a universal program, but we, uh, we dedicate almost, uh, you know, 80% of our housing is to what the city calls a quote unquote affordable housing, which is uh, kind of ridiculous. The, the, city, the city defines affordable housing as any housing that's affordable to people under 120% of AMI, which in the city is like $140,000 or uh, yeah, $140,000 uh, a year in salary, which is what we'll make. Um, so by having the gentrification protection in, it, it helps the neighborhood have input into what those income levels should be so that it doesn't actually you know, continue to cause gentrification. That's seems like a really important piece of the puzzle that maybe was, n you know, nobody thought about <clears throat> in the prior era of public housing. And, and you alluded to this a minute ago. I want to give you a chance to, to dive into this and unpack the significance of public housing owned by the public as distinct from affordable housing uh, that, you know, might be in the hands of, of private entities, however, you know, conditioned and contained from the rest of the real estate market. Can you just unpack the, uh, the distinction there for folks? Yeah, absolutely. The distinction that we make is, you know, publicly owned and publicly run housing is housing that's literally owned by the city. The land and the building is owned by the city and it's managed by the city. So, you know, dealing with all the, the financing and the, um, the actual property management too of making sure it's kept up and, and is not dilapidated like a lot of uh, public housing happened in the past, you know, defunding, uh, uh, cut a lot of money from being able to maintain public housing and so it became you know this rundown housing that no one actually wants to live in and so that's one of the, the ways that you know dedicating funding towards this is important for public housing in contrast with private housing where you know you're you're subject to your landlord or to your to an organization or you know a trust or something that owns your housing that can change you know the policies you know at, at their will there's a lot of you know affordable housing in the city that has a lot of restrictions on that, and so it actually is affordable housing. But we we have probably at this point um, only a thousand units or under a thousand units left of true public housing that is owned by the city and run by the city. And the reason that's important is because if you think over the long term, over hun you know tens of years, hundreds of years, you want to or, or we want to make sure that that housing exists and is still affordable to citizens of San Francisco or you know uh, anywhere um, to be able to live in that housing. And, and so, and there's plenty um, of examples, right, of that kind of housing as you're describing. I and mean, as as we look around the world, it's certainly the case that public housing is uh, 
well established in, in many other industrialized countries. It's somewhat unique here, kind of like our for-profit predatory healthcare system that we have this commoditized, speculative-driven housing market, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The the canonical example that people love to give is Vienna, where they have, you know, this mix of public housing, uh, some privatized housing and some market rate housing. But there's so many more examples across the world. You know, Japan, Singapore, um, they have a lot of public housing that they that uh, works kind of on the sim- similar model. Um, yeah. The UK is more closer to um, our kind of system that, where they have a lot of public housing, but it's slowly being privatized. Um, and so there's still a lot of public housing in the UK, but it's it's you know going down for a while. So there's there's plenty of examples around the world um, where you know this has hap- This public housing has been established and has been around for decades and centuries and works and is a, established as a model that people can actually have affordable housing and live in the city and have you know a vibrant city with um, you know working class um, actually being able to stay in their in their neighborhoods and and where they actually want to live. This is an important point I want to maybe tease out, and I think you, you pressed on it before in the gentrification protections, but it came out a little more uh, explicitly right there. You know, there is a intrinsic to the commoditized version of the housing market is this presumption that housing is a commodity, we purchase it from a good, there are no externalities, it's just a transaction between two people. But we've seen, particularly through the waves of gentrification and displacement that our city has endured, that the composition of the city, frankly, has shifted. You know, I've been in San Francisco in between times in Washington for 20 years, and the city that I came to in 2000 looks very different than the city I'm running to represent in 2020. And you know, talk about the the racial dynamics, if you will, and impacts of the predatory housing market, and how a measure like the Community Housing Act might better serve and meet the needs of San Francisco's communities of color. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's um, it's a really sordid history, unfortunately. You know, San Francisco, in terms of uh, you know racial uh, demographics, used to be you know have twenty percent of its citizens were black people living in the city, and there was a lot a lot of them were concentrated in the Fillmore and you know uh, now the Bayview districts. Um, and there is a history in the Fillmore, especially of um, uh, you know. The, the redevelopment agencies in the state and the federal government of, you know, taking over a lot of those public housing and, you know, pushing, pushing black people out of the city, literally. And there's this concept of uh, the certificate of preference, which is given to people who are pushed out of the Fillmore um, and they, they get the certificate to get, to be able to get to other housing in the city. But it's, it's, it's so such a sig- small, significant fraction of about, I think it's the last count was 1800 people have such a certificate and a lot of them don't even exercise it because it's just kind of this thing that the city gives as a, it's, it's like a literal certificate. It's, it's just a, you know, a stamp of approval that, you know, the city pushed these people out and they're not really giving them anything back. And you see this, you know, effect in the Bayview as well, where, um, all of the services, you know, tra- uh, transit, housing is just not dedicated in that area. And the city just, it's its kind of continually thought of as an afterthought of city politics. And, you know, they only recently established kind of a, in during the pandemic, a, you know, a, a homeless encampment uh, that was sanctioned in one of the parks because there's just no services helping people out during the pandemic and, and, and you know, getting people into housing. And so it's just, it's, it's happened, you know, over the decades of, you know, pushing black people out of the city. And so we want to make sure that our, our legislation, our proposed legislation doesn't continue to do that. And, you know, we're not perfect either as, you know, uh, creation of the legislation. And so we've, we've tried to really reach out to a lot of organizations around the city, to people who have expertise in, you know, doing, in crafting these kinds of measures to make sure that we're understanding what are the actual impacts of, you know, theoretical legislation. You don't necessarily know what the actual impacts are ex- until you actually go back to history and, and, and look at what uh, has happened before with, with well-meaning legislation. Um, but, you know, sometimes in the past, it's also been, you know, very, very racially targeted. It's not well-meaning. It's, you know, designed to push people out of the city. And that's what happened in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Well, and even frankly, through the 90s and the 2000s, you know, a lot of the recent redevelopment has come at the cost of long established. You mentioned the Mission District before, you know, obviously a long established Latino enclave that is less and less 
uh, reflective uh, of that yep. graphic. You mentioned the pandemic. Let's let's you know press on that in two different dimensions. Um, first, I want to see if you have any thoughts about the. Uh, so rarely have I been as very deeply grateful to be a San Franciscan as I have in the last several weeks. And looking at the, for instance, the contagion rates and the fatality rates in cities across the country, particularly New York City, where you know I have the. Uh, frequent occasion to speak with supporters. And it is horrifying to me what is happening there. And I feel so grateful that many of our local and state leaders were early in announcing shelter at home orders. And at the very same time, you know, you mentioned the total abandonment of our unhoused neighbors who during this pandemic were placed at very grave risk. And because this is a contagion, a very virulent one that places the whole community at risk, right? Is there anything you want to say there about the city dropping the ball on the pandemic as it relates to our unhoused neighbors? And I have another thought with respect to the pandemic as it relates to your campaign. Yeah, absolutely. It's just devastating. Um, you know, what, one of the things that a, a lot of homeless advocates warned here in San Francisco was that uh, the, the COVID-19 would run rampant through homeless shelters unless we actively did something to, you know, prevent that from happening. Because a lot of homeless shelters don't have, you know, the ability to do social distancing, don't have the proper uh, protective equipment, you know, gloves and masks and that kind of stuff. And, and so what happened was, that's exactly what happened. You know, uh, homeless experts warned about it, and then it started, you know, sweeping through a lot of the homeless shelters. And the city has not even, you know, the Board of Supervisors passed emergency legislation to, you know, force the city to acquire, you know, 8,000 rooms, hotel rooms for, you know, homeless or homeless people to be able to shelter and have social distancing during this pandemic. And the city just hasn't acquired them, you know, even even though this legislation was passed. And, and it's really terrible, too. Empty rooms where the hotels want people in them, yes? Yeah, absolutely. There are hotels that I mean, uh, hotel hotels have been completely shut down across the city because tourism has you know gone to down to zero because no one can travel and no one wants to travel. And so hotels, you know, they they would love to be paid by the city and have their you know hotels in use, but the city just doesn't want to acquire them. And it's it's even worse because what the the few thousand hotel rooms that the city did did get. Um, that is, you know, not nearly adequate enough to house the 10,000 homeless people on the streets. They require a uh, a positive diagnosis of COVID-19 before mm -hmm. moving them into the hotel room. So it's not anything about, you know, preventing uh, COVID-19 from spreading in the city. It's about, you know, uh, uh, quarantining them after the fact. So it's basically a policy designed so that, you know, this this coronavirus goes through the homeless population and they're just left on the streets anyways. And so it's basically just not even um, just dropping the ball entirely and just shrugging our shoulders and not even addressing it. And it's, and it's, it's just really horrible and, and really just disappointing. Yes. Yeah. I could not agree more. And for folks who want to learn more about this, I'll shout out a particular article by Joe Eskenazi at Mission Local, which did a great job responding to a piece in the Atlantic, which emphasized the first part of that narrative, you know, the the uh, positive aspects of our local leadership's response. And 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 Joe really dove into some of the uh, the more critical reflections of the city's abandonment, particularly of our of our unhoused neighbors. Last question. So we were just talking about the pandemic, which obviously impacts a great many things, including what campaigns to put ballot measures uh, on the November ballot can do. So do you want to talk a little bit about how the pandemic has uh, impacted your plans and the process going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, our our campaign for 2020 is probably going to be a little bit of a, a casualty of the, of the pandemic. Um, for uh, ballot measures in the city and the state of California, um, the California Elections Code requires signature gathering in person. There's no provision whatsoever for gathering signatures to place things on the ballot virtually. And this is kind of a, a relic of, you know, things before the internet age, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so we had our, you know, we filed the Community Housing Act with the Department of Elections in uh, mid-March. I think we had a rally at City Hall literally the day before um, uh, restrictions were put in place on large public gatherings because of the pandemic. And we just haven't been able to, you know, gather a single signature since then, unfortunately. And you know, we uh, we could 
go out and do stuff, but we we don't want to, you know, be the cause of you know spreading the virus. And so, you know, we've we've decided to to weather and and kind of bide our time. But unfortunately, you know, this pandemic has been lasting longer, especially in the United States, which is you know have policies that will probably extend it, unfortunately. And so our deadline to get on the November 2020 ballot this year, which was our goal, um, we would have to have those signatures by early July. And um, with the shelter in place orders extending through the end of May and possibly later, um, it's probably not going to be realistic, barring some, you know, uh, kind of stroke of stroke of luck. That's probably not going to happen. Right? You live to fight. So, another day. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're here for the long term. We think public housing is still, you know, a very good uh, way of addressing poverty. And we still want to advocate for that. And we'll still be around for it and, and be plugged into a lot of the organizations around the city. What we've been doing in the meantime is uh, there's a uh, law called Article 34, which is another kind of racist and classist relic of uh, California uh, state law, which says that um, any affordable or public housing projects need to go to the ballot to get approved. Um, and so uh, it's already passed um, the, um, uh, the state Senate. Uh, it's a constitutional, a state constitutional amendment that needs to go to the voters, um, but the uh, state Senate and state assembly needs to approve it. So we've been working on pushing that um, and trying to get that through the assembly as well so that can actually get on the ballot in November 2020. And we've also been working on a white paper around public housing and the community housing act kind of proposals in general. Um, and so those are kind of the two things that we've been working on in the meantime. Um, and we'll you know, continue to push our campaign forward in the, in the years ahead because this is not an issue that's going to go away in any time soon. Indeed. I want to throw you one question that's coming in from the chat. We're getting live questions coming in. So one person poses the question, would the cost of housing go down if the world population decreases? Thoughts? <sighs> that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if that's the case. We've seen actually in the pandemic that housing prices haven't really budged here in San Francisco. Even rents haven't really. And you would expect um, when you know housing isn't on the market and no one can can buy it, that that maybe things would fall. Um, but that's that's hard to say. Um, l land and housing is the most expensive part of a program like the Community Housing Act. Um, and one of the great things about having a policy like that in place is that you could take advantage of times when when housing prices are low and you right. can buy that housing and land at the lower prices and then put it into the public trust for times like this when housing prices are astronomical so whether the pandemic or <laughs> will actually do that i'm not you know i don't know if i have a crystal ball to say that but you know a, a policy like ours would be something that we want during these times so that we you know you're basically increasing the services that you have during times of crisis and then you don't need them as much when things are going well and the economy is running at a, at a, at a good clip. Yeah, if we think about what would have happened if this policy, the Community Housing Act, were in place in the 80s or the 90s, you know, before <clears throat> the prices here in San Francisco, you know, they've always been high relative to some places, but if the city had invested in publicly owned housing at a time when it weren't as astronomically expensive as it is now, not only would there have been a lot less gentrification and not only would there be a lot more housing in public hands, but the city's financial shape would just be incredibly strong because it would be an asset base that appreciates over time, right? I mean, I think that's a, another reason to consider moving in this direction. Exactly, you hit it on the nose. Where can people learn more? Um, you can go to sfcommunityhousingact.com. That's where um, everything about our ballot measure is and you can sign up to the uh, mailing list and we'll uh, post about any opportunities that you can help out with Article 34 or any of the other things that we've been doing in there. Right on. Simone, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Keep up the great work. Peace, brother. All right. Thank you to Simone from the Bernie Kratz. We're going to pivot now in just a minute to uh, another organizer here in the community, someone I've uh, long uh, admired and appreciated her voice very much, Shanti Singh is a tenants rights activist, and she's also the co-chair of the San Francisco chapter of DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Professionally, uh, she serves as a communications and development coordinator at a statewide nonprofit organizing for renters rights. She's joining us today in her individual capacity. Uh, Shanti, thank you for joining us today. Hi, good to be here. I should mention I'm not co-chair anymore because when I went, I left to go work on the Bernie campaign, but we have wonderful yep. co-chairs, ex-co-chair. 
Former, former co-chair of GSASF with us today. Thank you for, for joining us. Do you want to say anything about your time in LA with Bernie before we dive into housing? Um, it was wonderful. We won California by quite a lot. So uh, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Obviously, it's been a rough month lately, I think, for a lot of us. And, you know, things didn't go the way we wanted. But, you know, with everything that's happening, there's honestly no time to dwell on the past. We got to keep moving forward. But I'm very proud of the work we did in California. I'm sure a lot of the folks on this live stream put in all of that work. And we would not have done that without you. Not only did we overwhelmingly win California, I think 50 out of 58 counties, some like most congressional, like 48, 49 out of 53 congressional districts across the state, but we also increased turnout uh, in California in the primaries by about 1.6 million people. And all of you did that. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we proved that a socialist can win the world's fifth largest economy. So let's prove it again. Yes. Well said, and thank you for all your work on that campaign. It really was just uh, here in California, a bright spot in the presidential nomination contest generally. And I think uh, as much as you, I think appropriately thank the volunteers for being the boots on the ground, I think we all also uh, owe a debt of gratitude to the folks who did so much behind the scenes to make that possible. So thank you. Since the pandemic hit, there's been calls for a rent strike. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit and what the, the movement for a rent strike has, has looked like here in San Francisco? Yeah, so there's movements, there, there's a whole spectrum of policies and tactics that people are exploring right now. And I think it's important to kind of, I'm going to go through them for a second. Yeah. You know, on the, on the, I would say most to least radical. So from uh, starting with the least radical and the most basic is an eviction moratorium. And some people have reported that this is what Gavin Newsom implemented, but it's kind of what he didn't really implement was a full, it wasn't a full eviction moratorium. But, you know, just saying that you can't, you know, eviction moratorium, a good one would be you can't evict people for non-payment of rent for when they have lost income for coronavirus reasons, right? So uh, that's kind of the baseline, right? And, and Newsom's eviction moratorium that he passed statewide is just, you know, you can't file an, or you can file an eviction, but you can't physically evict someone. We are still seeing violations of that. So that's what Newsom put in place. That's the bare, bare, bare minimum. Uh, what actually was extra helpful was that the California Judicial Council, basically the courts stopped processing eviction cases. So basically the courts have shut down and that's actually done more materially to stop evictions from happening, but they are still happening. And in many jurisdictions, it is still possible to file them. Just, you just aren't supposed to physically evict someone yet. Hmm. So we're not hmm. even out of the list. That's the most basic. The right. main demand the tenants rights movement right now and you can see that at the local level with you know stuff that you know supervisor gene preston who's gsa endorsed um is championing but then also at the federal level with what uh, ilhan omar's rent and mortgage cancellation act yes. um, what what the main demand is right now is for rent forgiveness and mortgage forgiveness you know, you know for small landlords who are dependent on rental income so that's really where most everybody can agree that they're at right now is that we absolutely need to cancel rent payments, cancel mortgage payments, because if we don't fully cancel and forgive them, people are going to be evicted for non-payment because they simply can't, like no one, almost no one has six months, 12 months, even, even one or two months of back rent that they can just pull out of their savings when they have kids to feed, when they have no jobs, all of that stuff. So, right. especially um, in a city as expensive as San Francisco, right? Right, right. Yeah. Especially in San Francisco, especially in California, but you know, all over the country. So, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Real, the real demands we're seeing right now, it's like you know, cancel rent, cancel mortgages, having a debt-free future that doesn't, you know, like where, where people aren't haunted by their debt, or aren't evicted for it, aren't made homeless, but then haunted by it, like you know, months, even years after, you know, this pandemic ends, which hopefully will soon, but we don't know. Um, and so that, that's the, that's kind of the next step. And then some people are calling for, and some groups are calling for a rent strike. And that is, you know, kind of like the most radical tactic that people have at their disposal, but it's something that people have to be very, it requires a lot of organization. Like people can't just go on rent strike. What is kind of happening now is a lot of people are in like are basically unable to pay, but that's not really a rent strike. You know, a rent strike is something that's coordinated. It's something that, you know, people do collectively when they're collectively organized, they're collectively withholding payment. And so, you know, a lot of people are involuntarily unable to pay the rent. 
but that's not exactly a rent strike. Right. Um, right. There are calls for a rent strike, but as you know, one of the things that's just really important is that like people, when people go into things alone, um, they are, you know, the likelihood of retaliation is so much stronger. Yes. And so we really have to, we're trying to be cautious and, you know, informed uh, locally in all of these different places across California and across the nation in terms of making sure that people are supported. And right now our first priority is supporting people who just can't pay rent. They're almost, it's not quite an involuntary rent strike. That's because it's not a rent strike, but right. um, <laughs> versus to people who can't pay, um, whether it's their local tenant organization, whether it's getting them to help organize like their building um, and, and kind of build community in that way and push first for a demand to cancel rent and mortgages um, and cancel any related debt or evictions related to that. So. One thought, just to press on your point about the strike and the difference between sort of individuated, atomized, sort of like exposure to the marketplace versus you know, coordinated resistance. You know, A, that's the theory of labor unions, and it's what makes unions powerful is collective action. And in this context, I've heard people frame the calls for a rent strike as possibly relating to a, a more ambitious vision, even for a general strike. And I just want to you know, invite your thoughts here. When people talk about a general strike, they often think of it as withholding labor. It's obviously a very crucial part of it. The general strike also, it, it requires organizing to make available non-market-based alternatives to the market services we rely on. So like a general strike is going to require us figuring out how to feed each other and transport each other and take care of each other's kids. And like that's very much intrinsic to the vision that I think a lot of, sometimes falls off the table when people talk about it. But what it, what it means to execute a general strike is to organize ideally socialist alternatives to these market base pieces. Do you have any thoughts just there in terms of the building towards these visions of uh, increasingly assertive uh, demonstrations of, of influence for the working class? No, I, I mean, I totally agree with you. We have to do that. And like, I don't, I, I don't want to say that, you know, it's like the calls for a general strike. There are like kind of four conditions and this is similar to red strikes too, but like there are four conditions that you need for a general strike, right? You need generalized anger. We have that. You need a sparking event. I'm pretty sure we have that. Yeah. But the other two things we need is like a really strong institutional infrastructure yes. and willing leadership, right? So those Say are the, the other one? two. What was the last? Willing one? leader. Yes. It's willing leader. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so those are those are two of the things that are very that are really tricky. And you know I don't have any neat answers to this because we're in a situation where we absolutely are, are facing probably the direst conditions of our lives. But also we're in a position where the left, whether it's labor, whether it's tenants' rights, whether it's all these different things, where we've been institutionally weakened by 40 years of neoliberal austerity, by the decline or attack, rather attacks on organized labor. Um, and, you know, we can see that there is through like stuff, not just the Bernie campaign, but the, the wave of things that happened before the Bernie campaign, everything that's happened to Nate, for example, you know, all these teachers strikes, et cetera, et cetera. We yeah. see that the wave of working class anger is building, but we still need to really be careful and deliberate and thoughtful about like bringing the working class into more organizing and strengthening those institutions so that we are prepared. Um, and so it's not, it's, it's a, it's a really tough situation. I don't really, I can't say I have an answer or solution because we are facing really, really dire circumstances right now. Um, and there's a lot of preparation. It would have been great if we had all of this institutional strength beforehand. And so we're kind of having to, you know, remake that and rebuild that for ourselves. Yeah. But still a lot of reason to hope about that. I Absolutely. Could not agree more about the reasons to hope. And I see them every day. Do you see any reasons to hope, particularly in statewide housing policy? I know that Sacramento is, you know, one arena that you have a chance to monitor very closely. Is there anything happening in Sacramento that folks can get behind and support? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, besides, you know, right now we're trying to pressure Governor Newsom to cancel rent, cancel mortgages, all of that stuff. Um, but also, you know, what we've seen is in the last several years is an explosive growth in the tenants' rights movement. You know, Tenants Together is just one statewide organization. You have other coalitions like uh, Housing Now, which is like an ACE thing. Uh, there's a uh, Homes for All California. But even within Tenants Together, we now have, I believe, 45 members and dozens more like partner organizations. There are new tenant unions, 
while organizations representing low-income communities, communities of color against gentrification and displacement, there is an explosion and that's not just happening in like the Bay Area or LA, which are like more strongholds of tenant organizing, but you're seeing that in the Central Valley, you're seeing that in Orange County, you're seeing that in Contra Costa, you're seeing that in Chico, you know, you're seeing that everywhere. And that is already something that's been really building. Um, and as the crisis has escalated, of course, in Sacramento, it, it took legislators a really long time to take the housing crisis seriously. One would argue that they still don't, or the governor Newsom also still doesn't, and Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. certainly doesn't. Right. But you are you are seeing them. You're seeing them start to care, um, and then you can see that in the way that like renter bills have been progressing more. That they've been, you know, uh, for example, Assembly Bill 1482, which was you know, a, a rent cap, it obviously has a lot of exemptions, but it's still like a lot better than the status quo for a lot of people. You saw that that actually miraculously made it through the legislature. Um, one of the bills that Tenants Together is bringing back with Senator Maria Durazo in LA, uh, which was a bill that only failed by one vote last time, last year, you know, it, got, it got a majority, but rules, I don't know. Um, uh, but, uh, it's, uh, what we're bringing it back is um, the right to organize. And I think that's going to be a really crucial bill. Um, you know, while I'm not, not here speaking on behalf of Tenants Together, we can't endorse a candidate. It's not a thing, but I will say that like that is, that is a bill that Tenants Together is co-sponsoring. I think that's going to be really critical because the number one thing that people who can't make their rent right now need to be need to, to do, but out like be given the, the help and the resources to do is to organize in solidarity with the people around them. So they're not fighting this alone. Yeah. Um, so we're starting to see, and that bill only failed by one vote last time. Like I said, it got a majority of votes. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah, I, we're starting to see a lot more movement. We're obviously going to see the Rental uh, Affordability Act, which is the second attempt to slightly modify to Proposition 10, um, which was intending to repeal Costa Hawkins, which means it would repeal yeah. a lot of rent control prohibitions. Yeah. I think rent control was already a really popular policy. I think it's going to be very popular because of what's happening to people right now. So absolutely, um, yeah. There's a there's movement. I mean, in Sacramento, the movement can feel glacial. There are always a lot of setbacks, but even in Sacramento, I see that I see more forward momentum than than people have seen in no long time. Right on. When, and we certainly see a lot of momentum locally. I think about you know between Prop C in the last cycle, or you know Prop F, the civil right to representation, uh, as a, a, a local thing that San Francisco pioneered. You know, is the first uh, first municipality in the country here. And I think you worked on that, right, on Prop F. Yes, I did. I did. Um, that you was. Know, uh, that how it's impacted the community and how much of a difference we could make if we take it national? I mean, it makes an, it makes a huge difference, especially because, you know, this is a right to counsel for eviction is most of the time across the country when a tenant goes to court, 80 to 90 percent of the time they don't have a lawyer, whereas 90, 80 to 90 percent of landlords do have a lawyer. Right. They have no chance if they're taken to eviction court. Um, and if they lose their case in court, you know, they can have their credit scores impacted. If they're evicted in the first place, you know, they have records that follow them for up to seven years. I mean, it's something that haunts you like for the rest of your life. And uh, and it's so easy for landlords to evict because they know that tenants don't make enough money most of the time to have legal representation. Right. So we already are, you know, while that program is like still in the like full implementation process, we've already seen like really positive results from it. And it also spurred action in terms of the fact that, you know, when SF passed, when, because we passed a universal right to counsel that is not means tested, that is not, you know, about whether you have documentation or not, that's just for any person who is a resident, a tenant in San Francisco, regardless of your status. You know, we then saw immediately that New York, which had a means tested version, moved to double its means tested cap from 200 to 400 percent of the poverty line, like literally the day after. Uh -huh. We're seeing like, you know, right to counsel movements gathering momentum in L.A. There is a national right to counsel movement. So it's definitely it's definitely there's a place for San Francisco to be that leadership. And you can definitely see uh, how right to counsel has really picked up momentum and even been expanded in other places because of what we did and because we all on the campaign all insisted that this has to be a universal right and not something that's, you know, means tested death by a thousand cuts. Right on. And a perfect example of visionary leadership. You, know, you mentioned Dean earlier, uh, the role that he and 
and you, the local housing rights community, played in advancing that national opportunity. Now, I think is a great example of success, even in a dark time. You know, I, I hear a lot of people, you know, reflecting on dynamics in the presidential race, for instance. You know, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but there is a lot of bright spots, particularly at the local level. And I see it, you know, demonstrated all, all over in your work. Can one of the questions that came in from the chat is from someone who wants to know uh, about how how uh, how zoning affects affordable or public housing. Do you want to unpack that relationship for folks? Oh boy, yeah, that's a that's a really fun one. Um, how do I? Uh, I think one of my favorite things about zoning that someone said a long time ago was that you know zoning itself doesn't solve problems. Zoning is like a record of how we think we've solved problems, right? Okay. And uh, yeah. I, I think about that a lot because you really do have uh, exclusionary zoning is an extremely real and pernicious thing. It really does. It really does matter. Right. I mean, we have like NIMBYism is a thing in San Francisco. It's I think probably anyone who's ever tried to build a homeless shelter or hundred percent affordable housing or advocate for it knows that I'm sure like my colleagues on the working on the social housing act know that uh, the community housing act rather, but you know, it's also like it, Zoning can is very important, but also it has to be contextualized within, you know, community power and community power, especially for marginalized. So it's not just about taking, you know, structural power away from exclusionary communities who want to keep people out, but it's also about building power for marginalized communities. And that's also why I think like I really value the socialist approach, and that's definitely the approach that I take because it's beyond sort of the, the, the NIMBY YIMBY dichotomy, not that I have YIMBY friends, I'm not, not gonna get into that, but you know, it's, it's really looking at class power, it's looking at racial injustice and centering you know, what you're gonna build, not just you know, making it possible to build, that's important, but what are you gonna build after that? Who is gonna live in it, right? Because it takes intentional planning to, and it takes intentional planning, it takes left organizing, it takes you know marginalized community power to change this paradigm where real estate is both determining what gets built in upzone neighborhoods, you know, like the mission, but also real estate value is determining stuff not getting built at all in your places like Palo Alto or Atherton or Twin Peaks or Seacliff, right? And so you're kind of fighting real estate on both of those fronts and upzoning and downzoning can be tools of capital. They can be tools of the wealthy. They both can. But, you know, downzoning is not that's the solution, but just blanket upzoning, like without really taking into account race and class, that doesn't work either. Um, and I think that's why there's been such a movement for social housing, but also, you know, self-determination for marginalized communities, them having power and planning and development. Um, and bringing back social housing, public housing, subsidized housing of all forms. Uh, that's why tenants' rights is resurgent, et cetera. It's just all, you know, I think the approach to zoning should be rooted in the idea that yes, we absolutely do need more housing that people can live in, not, you know, super high-end luxury stuff. Right. But also that, you know, the people who are most marginalized by the housing crisis, who are the most marginalized by NIMBYism, but also most marginalized by gentrification, are the people who need to be leading the solutions forward and like that they have the answers and we need to empower them. As a methodological so, principle, yeah, it's a trick. showing up as an ally yeah. in the communities we stand in solidarity with, that's really important. Do yeah. you want to shout out any groups that are doing work here or any campaigns, ways that people can plug in to any of the work that you or others are doing in this arena? Um, oh my God, so much. Um, definitely, you know, if you're in San Francisco right now, like please volunteer with the San Francisco Tenants Union um, or the Housing Rights Committee also, like they're great. They need a ton of, you know, a, a ton of help right now. I mean, they're doing an amazing job, but they're dealing with an influx of evictions, eviction cases. They're dealing with people who are calling in who can't pay. You know, they're trying to organize as many people as possible. And, you know, tenant organizations were not famously very rich. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're local in San Francisco, like actually like committing, if you have volunteer labor to give, and I know it's a very hard time, but, but you know, if you plug in a housing rights committee, you plug in the SF tenants union and want to volunteer and be part of this organizing effort in your community and across the city, those are organizations that I definitely start with, uh, coalition on homelessness. If you're more like, if you're focused on homelessness issues, which are also really important right now as the mayor is dragging the feet. Um, on on housing homeless. Um, 
let's see what else. I mean, if you are outside of the Bay Area right now, uh, definitely Tenants Together is a statewide organization, and we have local member organizations across California. I would definitely check out, you know, tenantstogether.org um, and see, you know, uh, if there's local organizations that, you know, that are near you uh, that you that you can plug into. Um, let's see what else. And then, of course, if you are a card-carrying socialist, as I am, uh, DSA is definitely spinning up. Uh, a tenant organizing working group, a tenant okay. organizing group rather, um, that is going to be directly focused for the time being on responses and organ responses and coalition building around coronavirus specifically. So if you are in DSA and you want to get involved in that kind of stuff, we could definitely use your help. Uh, we definitely need people joining that group and figuring out what we're what we're gonna do uh, in that in that aspect. Let's see. And if you're not a social I think those are the if you're not a socialist yet, you can join DSA at one of our upcoming meetings, right? Exactly. Third, third Wednesday, is that right? Yes, every third Wednesday. So yeah, check us um, out. So grateful for you to for you joining us. If there's anything else you want to share, uh, please you know take advantage of that. Um, no, I just wanted to say, like, if you if you know someone or if you are someone who can't make your rent right now, like, know that know that you're not alone. Know that there's a movement behind you and you can join that movement and know that there's a lot of people around you who are going through the same thing. Um, that's really the most important, I think, takeaway. Um, and beyond that, like, we need action at the federal level. That's why I'm so glad that you're running, because the federal government is invested in public housing. The federal government has the resources to cover, to forgive rents and mortgages. The federal government needs to act. And so like, that's why we need representation in the federal government just as much as it has paid off in the local government. Right on, thank you for your voice today and for all your work, sister. I so appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye, Shanti. Bye. So just to reinforce some invitations there, do check out SF Tenants, uh, the SF Tenants Union and Tenants Together, the statewide, statewide organization, uh, Coalition on the Homeless, those are all important local organizations dealing with various dimensions of the housing crisis. And uh, do you plug into DSA as well? I'm very, uh, uh, as a, a card carrying socialist, very proud uh, to be a part of that network. I wanna give a couple last shout outs before we wrap up our time together this week. Um, you can sign up to volunteer with our campaign to replace Nancy Pelosi in the house at shahid.fyi slash volunteer. Um, we've got a few hundred people who've gone through the phone banking training. We'd love to include you too. There are uh, training sessions every other day. Um, I'll go through the schedule and then I'll list a couple particular skills that uh, we're particularly inviting to the team. So every Tuesday evening at 6 p.m., every Thursday and Saturday afternoon, so two and at noon. Again, sign up at shahit.fyi slash volunteer. Uh, someone on our team will be in touch with you soon. There are a couple particular sets of skills that we're especially excited to invite. So in addition to people calling and texting volunteers and voters, we're also uh, looking for uh, particularly extremely online Zoomers to help us keep up to date on social media. Uh, there are opportunities there in terms of uh, amplification, there's opportunities for content generation, there's opportunities for online organizing. We're very eager to train folks in how to do any of that and uh, welcome your participation. We're also very eager to invite technologists and software engineers who like to build cool stuff. We uh, can put your skills to use in a liberatory exercise. I wanna thank uh, everybody, certainly Simone and Shanti for joining us today. I also wanna thank our team and the folks who helped pull together today's live stream, particularly uh, our uh, Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, Derek Liu and uh, Emily Jones, who uh, helped pull together the talent, as it were. The rest of our campaign team as well, I wanna give a, a quick shout out to, you'll see their name in the names in the credits, uh, but they include our, uh, I mentioned Emily Jones, our uh, finance director, our field director, Otto Pippinger, our volunteer coordinators, uh, Christo, Jessica Matthew, and Patrick Cochran. Uh, we've also got a small army of uh, uh, people doing various uh, project focus work, volunteers. And if you're interested in getting involved, check us out, shahidforchange.us. There's opportunities in a bunch of different uh, dimensions. Oh, I wanna also shout out our newest hire. Just this week, uh, we uh, hired a new volunteer coordinator, Raya Steyer. We're very grateful for uh, her support and time on the team. So we've got a, a 
full staff waiting to welcome you and train you in the phone bank and all the other volunteer opportunities. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in today. I'm Shahid Buttar. I will look forward to seeing you at the same time, same place next Wednesday. Speak truth to power in the meantime. Good night, everybody. In 2020, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi faces a challenger of her own. Shahid Buttar announced his plans to challenge Pelosi on privacy issues, environmental justice, and the housing crisis. Not only does he support Medicare for all, but he also wants to cut military spending. He understands average, everyday people. We need a representative that really represents San Francisco values.
Stevenson was too crazy. When you do something as crazy as I did, you've got to back it up. When you do something as crazy as I did, you've got to back it up. (laughs) 